I am so pleased that we have the opportunity to talk with Norma Jean Wick, who may be a familiar name to some of our listeners and viewers today, because um, Norma has done some uh, work with audio description and the Olympics. And she is going to be describing um, the 2021 Olympics from Tokyo. So Norma, it's a pleasure to have you here and to learn a little bit more about you as a describer, but also as a describer of the live um, audio description of the Olympics this year. I'm so excited to be here and I'm so excited that we're actually at this point. I think they're gonna happen, which is pretty amazing considering what a challenging almost two years it's been. So it's really exciting. And myself and my colleague, Tony Ambrosio and our producer, Monica Downer are in the throes now of getting ourselves ready for another really exciting Olympics. Well, we've just learned a little bit about what NBC has to do to make audio description a reality for the end blind consumer who is out there listening and enjoying what, what your art provides for us. But we wanna delve a little deeper, find out a little bit more about you and how you prepare for doing live audio description. So let's find, a, let's find out a little bit about you and your background first before we start talking about Olympics coverage and how you're gonna handle that. So tell us just a little bit about Norma, Norma Jean and the, uh, the, uh, the art of audio description and how you became a, a describer and then how you got into the side of doing sports audio description. Well, I have a background uh, in both news and sports, but actually I, I wanted, sports was my, um, that was my chosen profession, but this was back in the 80s and women were not entirely welcome on the scene yet. It was still hard to find a place, um, but I started in radio and then I, I sort of, uh, was the de facto sports reporter as well as doing on-air stuff on radio. So I would do a split shift, get up at four o'clock in the morning, drive to the station, do the morning drive, rush down to the press conference, come back, file sporting reports and stuff, and then do the afternoon drive. So I did that for a while and um, ended up working for the CFL in media relations and then got a call to do sports on television. Um, so I ended up doing sort of interim hosting and reporting, but again, like I said, you know, wasn't getting all the experience that I wanted. So I took a job in news because I had a background in criminal law. This is a very long tale. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so anyways, I did that until we got a, um, NBA franchise in Vancouver which was where I was living at the time, Vancouver, British Columbia. So when the Grizzlies came, I had um, my a writer at, at Sports Page, the sports department at uh, the station that I worked with, uh, invited me to come and work for the Grizzlies. So that started me on a 12-year uh, journey in the NBA, working for both the Grizzlies. And then when they moved to Memphis, I worked for the Raptors. I was a host, a sideline reporter, where I produced features and content for specials and things like that. So I did that. And then um, in Toronto, I ended up teaching at a school. So teaching broadcasting at a sports broadcasting school, a private school. And so I taught features, I taught production, um, anchoring, reporting. So a variety of things. And I really loved it. And at the time I was working with Jim Van Horn, who is sort of a, a, uh, an iconic figure here in Canada in sports. And um, he worked at the school as well. And he got me interested in doing live description for Blue Jays baseball. So we started doing Blue Jays baseball games together. Um, and then um, he and I ended up doing Rio together through descriptive video works. And we had done some Paralympics actually before we did the Olympics. Um, and then once we did Rio for NBC, we just continued on. Last year I did Pyeongchang with Tony Ambrosio and this year, Tony and I are back together again for Tokyo. So 
um, kind of a long meandering history, but it mostly revolved around sports. So um, I was also an athlete growing up as well. So it's in my heart. I think even people who, who aren't necessarily sports fans are fascinated with the Olympics and sit down and watch them every night while they're, while they're taking place because there's, there's more than just the sporting event. There's the stories about the athletes and the, the sacrifices that the athletes have to make to get to that level of competition that they have reached in their um, athletic careers. And there's so many cases of, you know, overcoming obstacles and just incredibly motivating, inspiring stories that come out for, for people's desires and goals and lifetime goals that are yeah. just amazing. Yeah, the focal point obviously is on the athletes and the games. Um, and as you say, there are many vignettes. There's a lot of storytelling. And that's what makes it so engrossing and engaging is the stories. And not only do we hear about the athletes, so there are other elements, like we met, talked about the opening ceremonies, the pageantry and, and you know spectacle of the opening ceremonies, the closing ceremonies. And then there's a bit of culture as well because we're getting to know the host country. So there are many vignettes about arts, entertainment, architecture, food, so there's a whole lot of elements that go into it that make it a really um, compelling event to watch. And you obviously have a, a passion for the games and the work that you do. Uh, will you share with us a little bit what it means to you to be able to uh, help everyone experience and be a part of the Olympic, Olympic spectacle in spirit in pageantry and what kind of feedback have you all received by providing Olympic audio description in the past, Olympic and Paralympic audio description? Well, you know, first of all, I know myself and my fellow describers see this as an incredible privilege and a responsibility. And we're really here to serve our audience. That's the only reason we're here. So we take our jobs quite seriously when it comes to what can we do to enhance this experience for our audience. And so, you know, for us, we mentioned the storytelling because it really is a lot about storytelling and the broadcasters uh, that are employed by NBC um, are all great storytellers in their own roles, whether they're hosts or they're color or they're play-by-play -play or they're reporters. And so, you know, we mentioned it was an art description, but it's even more a dance because what we don't ever want to do is trample on or impede the narratives or the stories that the broadcasters are telling us because they, they give good information, they give compelling stories. And so we never want to step on that, but our job is how to dance in and out of that narrative and provide the color, the context, or the perspective that makes that story um, become more meaningful to our audience or makes it, it like I said, it gives it perspective. It, it, it fleshes things out in a way that doesn't happen um, sometimes when people just assume that, well, you can see it. It's right there on TV. I don't need to tell you that, you know, for example, we talk about sometimes even the culture, the scenery and all that, you know, there's a difference between naming something that's Mount Fuji or describing it, you know, a volcanic cone that rises 12,000 feet high, you know, with snow and ice covering it like frosting, you know. Um, so wherever possible, if we can add that kind of detail to something so that we're not just naming it, we're actually describing it, giving it shape and context and color uh, perspective, um, I feel like that's a lot of what we do. You know, it's all about the details for us. We try to do what our audience does, and that is listen. Listen to the broadcasters, listen to what's being said, and then again, try to find ways to dance around them to, uh, again, give perspective, more detail, more color, to enhance what they're saying. I've heard some 
some people say, well, isn't, isn't audio description for sports basically turning on the radio and listening? And you just said what audio description and audio description for a sporting event really is. It's not that we need to have it because we need to know the score. It's that we want to have it so that we know what is happening on the, the, the field or in the swimming pool or on the track mm -hmm. or because it's the, it's the pageantry and it's the drama. Yes. And sometimes, you know, a play-by-play -play man or woman isn't going to tell us that somebody is standing on the stage with tears rolling down their face as the medal is placed around their neck or it's the drama. And I've heard so many blind people say how much more enjoyable the Olympics were once they had that added piece to it, that they could actually feel the same kind of emotions that people were seeing on the screen of what the athletes were feeling, the, the elation or the despair if somebody had an injury and the, their, their chances for a medal were, were dashed and they're, they're in tears. Those are the heartbreaking moments um, for joy and for sadness that your description brings out. Yeah, it's context. You know, somebody can be emotional. Emotional in what way? Is their lip quivering? Are they hiding their face that they dropped it in despair? Are there tears rolling down their cheeks? Or say an athlete is struggling. Uh, in what way? Have they fallen behind the pack? Are they limping? Are they injured? Are they uh, winded? Are they, you know, so I, I do think for us, it's, it's the details that because as you say, we, we have a general picture, but we don't get the whole story. So let's turn to um, a little bit of the logistics from your side of the equation when it comes to an actual description of a, a specific sport or event. I won't ask if you have a favorite, but um, preparing for describing um, the Olympics, you know, how do you prepare for it and, um, you know, get yourself ready for that. We heard a little bit about the, um, the logistics of how you do um, some of the, the process. You know, a lot of people think you're sitting right there on the sidelines watching this live and you're in Tokyo, but no, that isn't the case. <laughs> so yeah, increasingly broadcasters are um, offsite Mm -hmm. And we're in a massive warehouse-like space on the MB in the NBC Sports compound um, with a bunch of little trailers. And we sit in these little booths in trailers. Sometimes, um, you know, somebody would be right next door. I think Pyeongchang, we had the figure skating crew right next door. Um, so yeah, there's just all these little trailers in this cavernous space where we go in. And typically we would just sit side by side. Um, this year, I understand we may have partitions, um, but um, yeah, and, and we trade off. So um, first of all, the research going into it, um, Tony has a sports background as well as I do. So we know sports pretty well and we're not really required to do play by play although it's very helpful to understand and know sports because you can jump in um, and know what's going on and know the terminology to describe it um, when you know the sports. Um, and so we have, NBC publishes binders and binders of research information on every sport. It will give you the history, it will give you the competitors, it will give you past performances, it will give you highlights, it will give you um, any news that has come out of that sport recently. Um, so we, we pay attention to all that because it's good to be up on current events. But myself in particular, what I like to do is get into more, again, details. Um, I remember somebody telling me after the Rio Olympics that they never knew what a pommel horse was, which is in gymnastics mm -hmm. until I described it. Um, so I like sort of describing 
the equipment because the announcers assume that you can see the balance beam. But I think it's helpful for our audience to know it's a 16 foot long beam that's three inches wide or credit card wide. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about four feet, it's raised four feet above the floor. Because um, again, it just gives more context, more perspective. So you know what these athletes are working with and working on. Um, so it's those kinds of details that I try to squeeze in wherever possible, just to give perspective and give context. Um, it's, it, I think it's interesting. The bar is, as I mentioned, the balance beam is about four feet above the ground. Simone Biles is four foot eight. So when she stands next to that balance beam, her head is barely above it. It's like, she's very diminutive. I think that matters too. You know, this, the average elite female gymnast is about four foot nine. So sometimes I like to give um, a description of the athletes. And again, it's something that, you know, people assume you can see when you, when they're on screen, but for our audience, I think it requires context. Uh, or maybe you have a, a long distance final and you have two runners on the track competing for the lead. And one is tall, lanky, over six feet. And the runner beside him is five foot six and lean. And, you know, it's just interesting to me when, you, you know, again, putting context on the competition, you have these two people who are of very different body types and abilities competing for first place. So I like to, again, add those details. So I tend to study more um, the uh, field of play, the equipment, uh, that sort of thing, just to help give perspective. So you will also be doing audio description coverage for the Paralympics, is that right? That's right. And, yeah. and that, and what are the dates for the Paralympics? And Clark, uh, Clark is a former Paralympian as well. So what sport? it must be especially exciting for him to see how far we've come to have description of the Paralympics. Oh, Kim, never former, never past, always a Paralympian. <laughs> uh, I competed in London 2012 in tandem cycling on both the velodrome, the bank cycling oval, and the road race and road time trial. Wow. And I... What an experience. I, if I was a, a child growing up, I would have loved to have had, excuse me, when I was a child growing up, I would have loved to have had audio description for the Olympics and the expanded coverage that uh, NBC Universal is providing now for the Paralympic Games as well. So it's, it's really exciting. And I'm just curious of the, because this isn't your first rodeo, right? It's not the, the first time you've provided, um, it's not the first time that NBC or Descriptive Video Works has provided audio description for the Olympics and Paralympics. What sort of feedback have you heard from viewers and those who have you know, uh, listened to and engaged with the audio described performances? Well, um, we, the first time we did the Olympics, uh, we were made aware of a letter from um, a member of the lower no vision um, audience who just described um, having tears running down his cheeks and feeling included. I get choked up, included for the first time. And that is so um, moving. And that's why we feel such a tremendous uh, responsibility and a privilege to try and make your experience of the Olympics better and to feel more involved in the action and to feel more a part of what's going on. And so that in itself probably was all I needed or all Jim needed or all Tony needed to hear for the rest of our careers. Because just to know that you can make a difference uh, in one person's experience means you've done something right. And specific to providing live audio description, is that, is that somewhat like working without a net? You yes. know, if something's pre-recorded, you can probably do multiple takes, right? But you, just like the athletes, it's yeah. 
winner go home, right? We can sound so smart when it's pre-recorded. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and like I said, you know, when it's live um, and, and we don't always know what's coming at us, you know, sometimes it takes a second or two to get yourself in that frame of mind or in that, in that scenario, in that situation. Um, so yeah, it's, it's tricky. And uh, the, also the tricky thing with live is that we cannot predict when the announcers are necessarily going to speak. So we're trying to find our way as we go along because everybody has a cadence, everybody has a rhythm and we generally try to figure out that rhythm and that cadence so that we know, oh, when that scenic shot comes up, we got about four seconds to get in a quick description. So we try to figure that out as we go. And um, so it gets to be a, a, a pretty well-oiled machine as we move forward. But in the beginning, sometimes it's just you dive in and you just keep your eyes and ears open and do the best you can to sort of keep up with, especially because there may be a lot of montages there, you know, in the openings, they tend to have a lot of montages and things. And sometimes you don't always know. They usually have a theme. They may have a section where athletes prepare for competition and then, you know, athletes uh, get ready for the race. So they're alone in their thoughts. They're, you know, shaking out their legs. They're doing whatever their pre competition ritual is. Then you have the heat of the competition. Then you have, you know, the, the joy of victory and the agony of defeat. So sometimes they have themes, but you don't always know. So you just try to try to figure it out as you go and just try to sense what the theme might be and work with that. Otherwise, it's just these random images that you're trying to dissect as they're flashing in front of you. So we, uh, we try to, it, it, it definitely is though, uh, as you say, Clark, dive in and see what happens. I mean, we, we do prepare, we do, I have my little index cards and I have my little, but at the end of the day, we sometimes can't predict what's gonna come. But that's what makes it great live TV. Absolutely. I mean, the entire Olympics is just that great mm -hmm. live TV. It, it's, it really is. And live you're, theater. Exactly, exactly. So you're going to be, this will be your third Olympics, won't it? Yes. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, I know I'm really looking forward to it. I'm, I'm trying my hardest to make sure my evenings are going to be free so that I can tune in. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. And I know Clark is, um, I think he's trying to do the same thing, clear his calendar so he can have some quality time with his wife watching the Olympics and really enjoying the description as well. Well, I really hope that for all of us, this is a really uh, successful games and that everybody uh, enjoys themselves, enjoys the coverage, enjoys the description and that we get lots of feedback and follow up. And, uh, and I hope both of you will extend that as well because we really do appreciate uh, the feedback that we get and the connection to our audience. Well, thank you, Norma, so much. It's been great to interview you and talk to you about um, the Olympics and, and learn a little bit about what you're gonna be doing for the two week cycle that you're gonna be pretty much engaged in. And um, I'm looking forward to it. So thank you so much. Me as well. And it was lovely to see you again and to meet you, Clark. <laughs>